evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's edition of the Triangle Area SQL Server User Groups Data Science and Business Intelligence Subgroup. It is already the fourth Tuesday of the month, and we are going to kick off with another great meeting. This is John Miner, who's going to talk to us about Databricks and a little bit of SQL warehousing. So please take it away. Excellent. Thank you for joining, and just give me a second. Uh, this what video is new to me, so I'm just getting around, getting used to it. But uh, I'm going to share my desktop now. So let's see if I can get this right. Picture, and now I'm going to show you some tabs. Okay. So first and foremost, I've been uh, talking to user groups for probably more than ten years. I actually got introduced to Pass from. Uh, Greg Fritchie, and um, great guy, if you haven't known, the Scary DBA. And then I actually uh, took over his user group for a while. Um, one of the things I've um, been proud of uh, achieving is I've been uh, awarded the MVP for Microsoft seven years in a row. And it's a great group. So if you want to aspire to uh, learn more about technology, continuously learning, as well as uh, being part of a group that uh, everyone's enthusiastic about it, um, that's why I love being an MVP. If you're curious, it just goes over the activities where I've been talking and enough about the MVP. Second thing I want to talk about is I love writing too. I've been doing this for a long time. A uh, little secret is that I do write for you, but selfless secret is I write for myself too, is all the code here actually works, okay? So it's kind of cool stuff. If you're curious about, say, maybe data engineering with Azure Databricks, Box, and Simnet, so you could go in here, and suddenly you can talk about the data lake, and we'll actually get into that today, okay? So uh, very good uh, topics here. I've got almost 100 articles, so please uh, browse when you get a chance. The last thing, last plug I'm going to get before I get into the presentation is my community repo, okay? So this is all the stuff I get for free. Okay. A lot of cool stuff in here. You can talk about Resource Governor, basic database program you've even done it. Uh, you know, uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight is Databricks SQL Warehouse. So if you click in the Databricks SQL Warehouse, you're actually going to get the same code that I'm showing you. You get my presentation, uh, any images I throw in the presentation. This is some data. If you don't remember Sales uh, LT, Sales LT, okay, is a database that Microsoft created. And what I did is when we work with uh, things in big data, we work with files, right? So here's some CSV files, some Parquet files. And we're going to talk about how Databricks, which is basically Spark, turned Spark into a SQL warehouse, which is kind of cool. Okay. So I'm going to drop that down. Um, last but not least, I'm going to see if I can stop sharing for a second. I'm going to hide my camera. I will turn it back at the end, but I just want to save a little bandwidth. Second thing is that way you can focus not on me, but the presentation. Um, it's going to be probably 50% um, words on the presentation screen, another 50% um, demos. And I also wanted to reach out to Kevin. I'm all set, right? Sounds good and everything. Not making any bloopers, hopefully. You're good to go. Awesome. And I'm going to point to you. If you see any questions in the chat, please read them. Uh, mark them about three or four times. I'll post within an hour. Say, hey, you know, any questions? And then at that point, I'll take some time. And if they have questions, and like, hey, John, how do you do this? And I'll say, well, I don't know. And I'll quickly Google it and show you where you can find some more information. So with that, I'm turning it off. I am going to share my screen again, and we're going to get into the meet. Awesome, perfect. So I'm going to minimize this, and this is my company's slide deck. I work for a company called Insight Digital Innovations. They've rebranded a couple of times to Insight Global. Um, I'm going to turn off the presentation view one more time, and then you should be good to go. I presentation view. So yeah, again, we're, okay, you're switched over now. Um, and there's a little whereby is hiding is sharing your screen. If you could click the hide, please. That way. Yeah, right. there we go. Awesome, Thank awesome. You. No problems. Like I said. I apologize. I've never used this technology before. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Uh, you know, it's just going to take a little while, so it's a little learning experience. So uh, again, we're going to talk about how Databricks created a SQL warehouse using Spark. It's kind of really cool. Uh, my name is John Miner. I'm a data platform architect at Insight Digital Innovations. You can reach me at john.miner at Insight. Please uh, reach out if you have any questions. Um, related technology, of course, right? Uh, purpose. 
you know, usually I'd like to talk about why we talking about this topic, right? There's a ton of companies that are moving their workloads from on-premise data to operational data stores, okay? We used to call them ODSs, maybe data marks, okay? To in-cloud data lakes, okay? And what they're using is they're using Spark processing as a key player in this transition. Spark's great. I've been doing it for three plus years. I love it, okay? But many end users, okay, like your typical end user, okay, that's not a program, he's not a data engineer, okay, do not know other, any other languages. They don't know Python, they don't know R, they don't know Scala, okay, they just want to get the work done, right? They might not know anything about distributed processing, they don't know what Delta is, they don't know what Pocket is, they just want to be productive in the environment. How can I look at the data that's already stored in the lake? How can I get to it? I know SQL, okay? So today we're gonna to talk about SQL Data Warehouse, which is an interface provided by Databricks to kind of open up a pathway for these individuals to actually be productive in the environment. Okay, so what is Databricks SQL? Well, before I get into Databricks SQL, I need to talk a little about Spark because Spark is the foundation for Databricks SQL, okay? And uh, if you hear me drinking a little, just to wet the throat. But anyways, what is Spark? Well, Spark is a unified engine, okay? If you look underneath the covers and you look at Spark, it's probably six to 700,000 lines of Scala code. And what is Scala? Scala is object-oriented Java, okay? So we know what you know, Spark is. It's some type of engine, try right? What can it do? Well, there's four things that it really does well, okay? It allows you to do data engineering, okay? So I'm going to move my pointer to the top left uh, icon or uh, image over here. So you can see SQL and data frames. This is how we pull data in. We can read something into a SQL, and we can read into data frame, do some type of manipulation, so the transformation, and write it back out. So that's data engineering. It does three other things also. It does machine learning. Okay, so uh, if you want to, again, this is a machine learning group, so I'm not going to go into it. You probably know the questions, the five questions that machine learning can answer. Uh, it does streaming. Nowadays, things come in at a velocity. It's really fast. Like back in my days, and again, I say my days, but I've been in this industry for 32 years. Uh, say 15, 20 years ago, I was at a bank. It was batch processing. They had a mainframe. It happened once a day. It didn't happen every second, right? Nowadays, we have data coming in every second, right? And there's some problems that are really solved easily by graph, right? Say if we wanted to you know, do some type of hierarchy and figure out, hey, or maybe some type of uh, modeling, like, hey, how can I travel from point A to point B the fastest or maybe the co most cost-effective or maybe see our top clients first, right? Those are problems that you can solve. Okay. So now that we know what Spark is, hmm, how did they take it from this engine and convert it into a warehouse? Okay, so this is kind of the diagram you'll get when you go to the Databricks website, okay? It's basically a interface that looks like Snowflake, really. It's kind of funny, uh, but you know, you have some of the features that you'll get in a data warehouse, right? So Underneath of it, um, the actual engine, okay, we have a delta lake, okay? And that's the thing I showed you from MS SQL tips. And basically, what is a delta lake? It's just some storage, okay? And what is storage? Well, we divide it into containers. So we have a logical container called bronze, right? It could just be a folder. It could be a physical container like an Azure, maybe a special object, a container object. We have silver and we have gold. And what do these mean? The talking about quality, okay? So when you get bronze, you usually have raw data in there. There's no quality change to it. You just ingest it, okay? And silver, maybe you dedupe stuff. Maybe you add stuff to it. Like, for instance, if you're getting information about sales, right, and you wanted to fix an address, you could do a lookup. Use a service, right? Maybe fix a zip code, okay? That's your silver. In gold, guess what? Maybe we don't really care about the customers so much as what the products were sold today and who do we need to ship to? Maybe that's a ship to report that we're generating. That would be in gold, okay? Um, Delta Lake, we'll talk about this, but Delta file format, okay, is based upon Parquet. And what allows you to do is have those asset properties as a database, okay? Um, so SQL Analytics, Analytics is the same thing as Databricks SQL Warehouse. They just renamed it. This is an older slide. When you go into it, what do you see? You see a SQL editor, so you can stop 
typing SQL. You have what you just recently ran, a query catalog. And queries, unlike SQL Server, okay, can run once time, or you can set them on a schedule, which is kind of cool. You can also have dashboards and alerts, okay? One of the things they did while going through the road path, um, you know, the path to actually make this go to fruition is that they found that Spark was a little slow on executing some things. Like they have something called the optimizer, the Catalyst uh, converter. And in there, the uh, Catalyst uh, optimizer, basically, you know, it was fast, but it wasn't fast enough for these queries because you have to, you know, people get impatient. If it doesn't run in 30 seconds, then, hey, you know, where's my data, right? And big data, 30 seconds, that's not a big deal. If I can get my answer in, you know, 30 minutes, I'm happy, right? So they came up this engine called uh, faster compute called Photon, right? It's a uh, sits on top of Spark and just makes things execute faster and optimize, okay? There's some security. Of course, we want to connect to this warehouse, right? If we have this warehouse by itself and you always have to use Databricks, no, no one's going to use it, right? But we have all these people to the right over here, like say someone that's using Tableau, someone that's using Power BI, maybe we were in Synapse and we want to do something, or we're doing Azure Data Explorer. So again, this is the high level design of Databricks SQL Warehouse. Okay, so now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to in a slide or two. I don't know if it's a slide or a next slide. I'm going to segue to a demo. Okay, we're going to talk about the SQL editor. Okay, how to explore the hive, create queries, execute one time on schedule and save code files. We're going to talk about workspaces, how to manage folders, code files, and dashboards. Queries. We talked about past executions versus current alerts. How do we learn on a given condition? How do we explore the hive, right? The warehouse, how do you define, start, and terminate computer power? And last but not least, the admin console. Like, there's some parameters you might need to set in a warehouse. Like, hey, by the way, here's the secret to get to external storage. Let's add it, and so I can get to some directories that have, say, the bronze data for Roar, OK? Um, so, we're going to talk about a simple database example, right? We're going to explore the warehouse. Uh, we're going to create some called basically the autos database. It's something that I created a long time ago, probably about 12 years ago. It's a very simple database, right? We have some continents, a where, which country lines to a continent. And then we have some statistics from Wikipedia about automobiles, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to go through the normal stuff that you explore in a database scheme is tables, views, DML statements, integrities. And we're going to see what's different in the warehouse versus what's in Spark, OK? So I'm going to go into the de first demo. But before I do that, I'm going to reach out to Kevin. Is there any questions? There are no questions so far. Although, if, uh, chat, if you've got any questions, get them in, and we'll make sure to ask. Awesome. Thank you. So when you go into Databricks, okay, and I'm going to go back to the dashboard, we talked about some stuff. Like, for instance, we might need a key vault, okay? And a key vault, okay, if we look under secrets and keys, we can see secrets. There's some things you're going to probably need. You're going to need, okay, a service principle to connect to storage. You're going to need a password. You're going to need the 10 ID, okay? So that's what's in this KBS tips for 2021. It's kind of old. I should have probably put it 2030, and it would never expire. We need a storage cap too, right? Remember we talked about how um, this is all um, done with storage. And again, I'm going to start off not even getting into the storage, but I'm going to kind of show you a little, right? So we can come in here and we can see ADLS for 2030, right? And we can see, hey, by the way, here's a bunch of data, right? We'll get into that soon. And we're going to talk about the VentureWorks data lake and so on, okay? And last but not least, we have the workspace. So if you haven't used the workspace before, you can hit the launch button. I'm going to launch another version of it because it doesn't drop you automatically into SQL if you have multiple choices, OK? So if you have multiple choices, you're going to drop into the data engineering, science and engineering tab, OK? And what you want to do is go down to the SQL tab. And if you go to SQL tab, you're going to get something like this, OK? So this is our SQL editor. So let's take a look. So we have SQL Letter, and we can see it's loading. OK, hopefully our, I created a new warehouse tonight. We have some data that came, OK? So we can write our first SQL statement, right? Like everyone says, hello world, right? That's text, right? 
And we run it. Does it give us hello world? And it should. Okay, so it did. Again, is it blinding? Yeah, it's three seconds. Nothing really that bad, right? The idea though, again, the whole premise is to give it interface for people that are not really technical to get to the data, okay? So we see that there's a couple uh, demo counts here, right, or demo tables. So we get some nice context sensitive help here, so we can go explore from employee. Now, one of the things I want to tell you is this, is that this is running in default. We have a bunch of other things here. So if we're using Unity Catalog, we could connect this to another uh, system, okay, and get those Hive databases in. We can see we have VentureWorks, VentureWorks 2, okay, we'll talk about that. Uh, we also have the one we're going to create pretty soon is Azure Databricks SQL, okay. But this is the demo, okay, um, actual table here. It's in default, okay. One of the things I want to tell you is we can limit the number of statements or we can run all statements. So if you get rid of those, you have to highlight and hit run. Okay. So if we select from employee, we should get some data back. Okay. So one of the things I can look at is that it is kind of large one interface. This is the first version of it. Um, it did get the results. That's awesome, right? Um, we can do some things like download it, right? We can add to a dashboard. We can visualize it if we want, okay? We can make a copy of it, okay? Also, because this is the web, okay, we can try to collapse it. We can see it's paginated, okay? So if we want to see more data, we have to go tap through, okay? So now that we talked about how to do our very first program, let's look at some of the stuff you can do. We talked about the SQL editor. I'm gonna look at the workspace, okay? One thing that's kind of weird about this is the workspace, if we have a shared environment, will show everything here, okay? So you just have to remember that. So in shared, I have like MS SQL tips I write from them. So, and I also uh, do stuff for Stack Overflow. So we can see all my Stack Overflow. And if we try opening it, Let's see if it opens. Yeah, it'll open it, but then it's kind of like, did it switch it? Not really, right? So I'm surprised that that actually did work. And again, they're kind of mixing, matching some of this thing. If you look at the Data Explorer in the Spark Data Engineering, now it's using a SQL cluster, which is kind of interesting, right? So the the kind of blurring the lines between the two. Um, but the main thing is under workspace, under shared, right? We can go to our warehouse, right? And what we have is we have basic features, right? Data lake files. And so we're going to get into basic features. Okay. So the syntax you're going to be using when working with uh, the database is Spark SQL. Okay. So we can say right here, we saw this is default, but we saw there's a schema called ADB for Azure Databricks SQL. So drop the schema. Let's drop it. Going to rebuild everything from scratch. And hopefully it's not running them all. So I am going to make sure that we get this off. And I'm just highlighting this. We'll run this again. So just be careful because if you don't highlight it, it might run them all. And then you're like, oh, wow, where did everything go? Or everything's suddenly there. So we can see now the Hive database has been dropped. We can actually create a new schema and describe it, OK? And this one, I actually have a comment. There's a sample Databricks uh, statement, right? So we're going to run this. And we can see that this is a Hive meta storage, right? It's just basically the Hive meta store is just a directory. It's in a root, right? Nothing's been really created yet. And we can also do is we can add database properties like extended properties in SQL Server, right? So we can set and it's a bunch of tuples. So created by John Mine, it could be anything. Great day. I did it on the first. I could have changed it today. So now if we run this and we describe extended again, now we get more data, right? We can see that by the way, we all the data before, but now we have these property tuples. So some nice features if you're creating a database from scratch, right? We're going to start into the real meat of and potatoes of this, right? It's going to be, hey, let's see if I can make this just a little smaller so I can fit everything in. It was greater than 100% before. But again, you know, it's in the Windows, right? And it's in the Explorer, so you can use your control up and down arrows or your scroll bar. So I'm going to create a table. And we can see this is like kind of the same thing, create table. Uh, 
a little different syntax before it was varchar right for sql server and again i'm gonna talk about sql server comparing it to like a database with string not null so you can do nullability and then we can describe it And again, hopefully it's not a cloudy day. Sometimes things run in low in the cloud, but we can see now it you create it in the, the database, ADB, SQL, it's content. Why is it called managed? Because it is a managed table. It's not a remote table. We're not pointing to stuff that, say, maybe data engineering did. We're pointing to something that we did, right? So we can see that in here, this is under that directory, but now it's a subdirectory and it's a Delta table, okay? And it gives you some information about the checkpoints and stuff. You can look into that later. So now we have our first one. We want to load some data. Let's take a look. Is there another way to use? And sure enough, there is. If we click the My, uh, Hive Metastore, and then we click on the database name, the one we just created, we can see that the table of content actually showed up. Now we're going to load some data. It's just a simple and direct statement. I mean, it's not writing home my about anything interesting yet. And then we're going to select the data from the inserts, right? After we insert some data in the table, if we did it first, the select it would have been empty. Uh, now we'll get some data back. And like I said, you know, it took 11 seconds. So this is not blinding fast again. But again, everything in big data usually is not blinding fast. So we're going to create a table for cars, right? And we're going to show the table. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip right to loading because, you know, again, this is simple stuff. And then we're going to show the uh, data that we just loaded. So now I'm batching statements. Please note that it's very important to use semicolons. Semicolons are optional in SQL Server. Uh, if you move them in here, it's going to get confused and it's going to error out. Okay, so now we can see that we have uh, a bunch of them. Right? So uh, I don't know why I only showed two. There's, okay, because it showed two, but the display, okay, is a lot bigger. And it said, "Hey, guess what?" It didn't understand what's going on. So if we hit refresh, and now we have two tables. Okay, so so far we showed how to create some tables, and now if we just basically do a join in the tables, right, we should bring some video back. So we join the actual sales of, you know, number of cars per continent. And now we have E, which was the continent, and we bring back South America and F for Oceania. That must be Australia and so on. So now, usually when we do like, you know, Snowflake, right, we bring a bunch of data into tables and then we create views and build upon it, do some engineering that way. So let's create a view. We're going to take everything from country and we're just going to add the name of the continent okay and we're going to join the two tables on the id and then select the table the view actually so car data is a view interesting thing guess what if we look under here car data it thinks it's a table so the difference between tables and views is not distinct okay so you just have to make sure when you look at stuff that uh, you can do a describe and you can actually find it it's a view not a table okay now, we saw that there's cars by country, okay, was uh, one of the tables we created. We can add some extended properties. For instance, we can add created by and created date if we want at the top of the table. We can add a com comment to the table, a number of um, cars per country. We can add a comment to the column, which is really cool. That's one of the things I kind of miss in SQL Server. They don't allow, you know, like Oracle type comments. So we're going to run this. And then we're going to look at some different things you can describe, okay? So now we made this uh, actual table, uh, actually altered it, should I say. We added some columns. Uh, and again, look at the syntax. You can alter and set the properties. But if you want to do a comment on the table, you have to use the comment on command, not to alt the table, add comment, which uh, one would think it would be the command, but it isn't. Uh, if we do show tables, it's going to bring up the three tables. And we can see that there's no comments coming up, right? But it shows you, is it temporary? No, it's not a temporary view, right? It's a table, right? Uh, we can also show the details, right? So limited details. We're going to run this. Describe table. And now we can see, hey, guess what? We have all the details. It's a primary key for the table. That's our comment. 
and nothing else. And then we have the data types. If we go ahead and say show extended, we can see now that we get information back that's from the hive, right? So now we get all that stuff about the catalog schema, but we also have, hey, by the way, we get the created buys, right? And we also have the location, okay? And there's a lot more details here, like statistics and bytes and checkpoints, all that information, what version Spark, so 3.31, so on. And last but not least, if we do the show extended of details, it shows a different view. So that one was tough to uh, manage, but this one actually is a little nicer to manage. So we can now say, hey, it's Hive Metastore. It's a table under the ADB SQL. It's managed. We can see where it's located. It's a delta table, right? it's an owner. And guess what? We can get the created bias, right? It didn't give me the column information. Uh, oh, actually, it did too. See, right here, column information. So that's probably the prettiest you can get of the output. So to wrap it off, we're going to talk about integrity, okay? And it's a, it's an important part of, you know, um, most databases. Warehouses don't do a good job at it, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take this table now. If we hit refresh here, this should only be three, right? We're going to take the cars by country, and we're going to add a constraint. We're going to say, hey, that country idea, it's a primary case, right? So if we run this, and guess what? It's going to fail because they're not supported in the Hive Metastore. You have to enable uh, Entity Catalog, and that's a talk uh, way advanced out of this talk. So that's not going to work. How about we try doing a on something else, maybe a different column? And guess what? It's not going to work again. So this is going to fail. Also, foreign keys fail, right? OK. So at this point, one of the things we could do is we could say, hey, let's do a check constraint. This is the only thing that actually works, OK? So we can put check constraints, unless you do entity catalog. And this is because the check constraint is at the actual file level. It's not at the high level. So we can run this. And guess what? It's going to fail, not so much that we can't build it, What's going to tell you that you got a violation? And this is cool. This is like SQL Server. We create a constraint, and if there's a violation, I'll tell you. So now I can go back and say, okay, well, I know everything's between 100, negative 100% 100 change and 100. Okay, we're not going to allow more than that. Obviously, in real life, that could be percent change could be a lot bigger. But um, that's my rule. And guess what? Now it suddenly works. So now we checked all the data. Okay, so let's play with some CRUD statements and see, hey, is there something different, okay? Um, just want to double check to make sure I'm going consistent with the points that I wanted to point out. There's one that's coming up. I haven't seen it yet. So we're going to show select star from country, across by country, given the name Greenland. Does Greenland exist? And the answer is no. So we're going to add Greenland, okay? And then we're going to run the select statement again, and Greenland after insert will work. OK. So now we should see Greenland. And one of the things we do, and this is kind of cool, because this is all file-based. It's not really a database, right? I know how it sparked, right? But it looks like a database, right? So now we're going to update, change it percent to 10, right? Before it was 0. And now we go after it's done running. And um, one of the things that's interesting, it doesn't support Mars. So if you run more than one statement at a time, you're not going to get multiple results. That's okay. So now we can see that change percent is 10. We can also delete from here. So now we're going to run this, and we're going to delete that record. And now we run this again. And lo and behold, guess what? The record's gone. Okay. So now I'm going to put this, for this demo, I'm going to put this this way and then save it for a second. So that's our save button, OK? So what we want to do now is we want to create a table with a identity column. Identity columns are cool, right? They allow, help us with surrogate keys, right? So we're going to do missions by country. We're going to do country and missions. And again, this is all fake data. So I'm going to create the table. I'm going to insert two records, OK? Data's fake. It's telling you that I did not get it from anywhere. It's just here to prove a point. OK, 
Okay, so now we show some data. Now, if I show the data, okay, so we get two records. What happened if we delete from it, okay? So now we're gonna delete from it, hit refresh, I don't know why that's going away. And now we can see run. Oops, I deleted, sorry. I want to do the select. So if we do the select, there's no data. Now I'm going to insert it, okay? So this should automatically increment. It should be 3, 4 now, okay? Okay. So one of the cool things about SQL is when we do a truncate, it resets the identity column for us, right? So we're going to do a truncate. Okay. And what we're going to do is going to insert these two again. And then after we do that, we're going to do a select. Oops, that's not what I was expecting. Truncate, because it is really Spark, doesn't work the way you think it would because of concurrency and stuff. It does not actually reset the identity column for you. What's the way around it? Well, if you're truncating it, guess what? You really dropping the table and recreating. I mean, other than some schema things, you you know, truncate doesn't drop it physically from the catalog. But in Spark, if you say create or replace table, it's going to recreate some new schema for you. Okay, right? it's going to get rid of that schema. So I'm going to replace it now. If I do the two inserts, okay, and we select now. Guess what? Lo and behold. Guess what? We have a resetted column. Okay, so now we run this. Okay, so this is a great time to pause. Any questions? So, so far we have no questions. However, chat at any time, if you have questions, get them okay, in there. Cool. Uh, it looks like we switched back to presenter view. Yep, I'm going to get there. <laughs> there we go. A little slow tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Take a little sip. So we talked about the simple database examples, right? And we went over how to create schema tables, views, uh, DM cell, uh, ML statements. So insert, update, delete, work perfect, right? Um, you can even try merge if you want. To. It's supported. Interesting thing, it integrity. Integrity only supports check constraints. And the biggest thing also is when creating stuff with the identity column, the truncate does not reset the column counter. So you need to basically drop the scheme and recreate it. So create a replace table. OK, so data lake files. Let's talk about some starts, because so far we've been working with managed tables. Those are interesting, but not as interesting as unmanaged tables which means remote tables. That means it could be on a hey storage. It could be shared between workspaces. Maybe we have group department A is actually going ahead and running Spark programs for data engineering, and B wants to consume them. We can do that. So most services, and again, I'm just going to give you some foundation stuff. Um, most services are built upon the foundation of three copies. If you didn't know it, just telling you. So when you write a file in a data center, there's three copies somewhere. And that's basically for business continuity, OK? And if we go ahead, we can increase it by, they talk about nines. Like, you get three nines. You can go to five nines, maybe, right? And five nines is, guess what? We not only have three copies in data center A, but we go from east US to, say, west US. Now we have five nines because we have another three copies in another data center, OK? Um, Automatically, data centers are paired for geo redundancy for this, so you don't know it. But you know, even if you didn't say, "Hey, make another copy," they do make uh, send backups. The question is when, and it's paired with the West data center. Okay, so access to storage. Okay, there's several ways to access storage: storage account keys, shared access signature, and service principle. What are they? Let's get into it. The storage account key is kind of like the Lord of Rings, okay? It's the one key that rules all, okay? Don't give it out, okay? Once you get that, you get full access to it. In fact, in the current version, okay, of data lake storage, you can actually turn off public endpoints, okay? And if you wanted to, like, be net your storage against uh, uh, data bricks, you could kind of, like, get rid of the public endpoint. But um, should access signature. It's a little better than a storage account key. 
first is we can give it out the container well. So if we break the data lake in bronze as a container, silver as another container, and gold as another container, then what we can do is we can give access out at each container. That means the people that write to the bronze, which is raw, may not see silver and gold, right? Uh, we can also not only give it different levels, we write execute, list, but we can also give it a time period, okay? Problem with that is, yes, it might expire. Last but not least, and the, my favorite is a service rental. It's a fine way to give out uh, access to ADOS. And we'll talk about the different ways that you can give out um, security. Okay? So how can you copy the data to Azure Storage, right? Well, more than likely in your data lake, you're not generating the data there. You might be, but might be coming from IoT. It might be event hub. You might want to read from event hub. AZ copy will not help you there. PowerShell will, right? But here's two file-based commands that you should know pretty well, okay? First one is AZ copy. I love it. I use it right now for a client. You can use it from the Azure command line interface, which is Cloud Shell, okay? Uh, you got two signatures. Guess what? You can do cross-tenant copies. That is awesome because they, they decided that they had one facility that is company A, and you suddenly had a merger, it's company B, and how do you share data now? Guess what? Easy copy what is, shared access signature will work. Uh, PowerShell is also de facto, so there's many ways, commandlets out there. Uh, if you don't like the command lines, those are two, use Azure Storage Explorer. And I move my pointer here, Azure Storage Explorer, I'm kind of highlighting here. And guess what? That's a GUI on top of AZ copy, and it makes it like Windows Explorer. You can copy up, you can copy down, do bulk commands. Okay, so I remember when Gen 2 Azure Data Lake Storage came out. I think it was maybe four years ago I was at Microsoft, okay? And what it is, it's basically a high-performance blob system, okay? So they rewrote it, and they put it on regular blob storage, okay? Why do we like using it? Because it's Hadoop HDFS, or Hadoop Distributed File System Compatible. And it's also called ABFS, right? Azure Blob File System. You'll see it out there. Some of the cool things, encryption at RAS and transit, firewalls you can turn on. We talked about VNetting. Okay, so remember we talked about the serverless principle. And I said, I'll get into security. Well, here's where we're going to get into security. Microsoft for years was talking about RBAC, role based access control, right? Now they renamed it to be in line with AWS. It's called IAM. So if you look for it, I am on the security portal. And there's also something called hierarchical namespaces. On so a past blob storage was just a tag. You gave it a folder path, but it wasn't really a folder path. It was just a file path. Okay. It was just a tag, right? And then uh, we can also give security at each point. In old blob storage, you couldn't do that. You either got access to the whole container or you didn't. Okay. So data lake quality zones kind of showed this. We're redoing it from the you know web page I showed you the article. Basically, this is called Lambda architecture. So if you got batch, maybe you're ingesting, say, say the data warehouse, we're getting a feed from on-premise from SAP, and we get enough feed from Salesforce from the cloud, we get maybe batch. Or maybe some stuff we have, you know, we're plant and we're producing stuff. We're getting streaming to event hub. That will go into your bronze layer. And this is, of course, a um, picture from, you know, Databricks because we see this little delta and they're using delta files in each one. Okay. And the last but not least, you have AI. So Lambda architecture has two lanes, a slow lane, which is batch, and a fast lane, which is streaming. And when you go from bronze to gold, you're just increasing the quality of the data, making it cleaner, adding better uh, components to it, so that at the very end, you have something that's reportable. OK. One of the things we definitely want to talk about is file types, right? We talked about you know everything's built with Delta. And most of the stuff you get with Delta, I also want to talk about what's weak and strong, just in case you're pulling data into your data lake, which is going to go into the warehouse, right? What's the problem with weak file types? CSV, JSON, OK? First, it's a lot of bloat, right? So you get a lot, all those commas all over the place. Especially JSON, you get all those tags all over the place. Second thing is, can it be easily broken? Yeah, I put an extra comma or two in and suddenly break the whole file format, right? Doesn't allow for compression. I mean, you could do gzip afterwards, but not that great. What I like about Parquet, and again, there's other formats like Avro and Orc, okay? But Parquet is because it's middle of the road. It does decent performance. 
and it's the basis for delta, okay? Uh, you don't have to guess. Like, for instance, CSV, if you don't give it a header, I don't know what the names are. I was just going to put C1 through C end, right? Um, and C ends like a number. So I have 10 columns, I have C10, right? Second thing is, if it's Apache Parquet, I know what the name it is. I know what the format is. So if the first column is a social security number, and guess what? Maybe it's America. It's all digits. It's a number. If it's maybe another country, Canada, maybe I'm again guessing, but maybe they have alphanumeric, so say C in it. Guess what? It would tell me it's alphanumeric. It's a strike, right? Again, I wouldn't have to read up the whole file like we file formats, okay? So access. One of the things we need to do, okay, is, uh, you know, there's three ways to access remote data from the warehouse. We talked about it again, service principal, storage credential, and shared access signature. I'm not going to do it because there's probably enough time. We only have an hour. But I'm going to show you how to do it. Just show point in the right direction. Um, there's Google, and there's also DataWorks, and you can go find more information about it. So these are going to be in the admin settings. So those user settings and then admin settings. So we go in the admin settings, and we can see in admin settings, if you're an admin, you can add users, and you can give them some things like, hey, it's an admin. Do they have access to the workspace? So I'm Crafty DBA. That's my handle when I was just doing SQL work. But now, say we get Dilbert or Dogbert. Say we can give them... SQL access, we can say, hey, they can create a cluster or not. Okay, we can also do security at group levels. Uh, we can do any type of init scripts, okay, and then workspace settings, okay. Uh, the biggest thing we want to do, and we can go over this, tells how SQL is going to, you know, work, like failure emails and workspace calls. I guess you can create them and stuff like this, and they, they keep on changing us all the time. So I definitely do not know everything on this page. But one of the things I do know is that the SQL Warehouse setting, there is a data access configuration. And what you can do is you can click that Add Service Principle, and what's going to ask you is those key information, the storage count, the application ID, uh, client ID. Okay? And if we look at that, this is real information. Then we do the directory information. The interesting thing is we have to create a secret scope, okay? And we have to give it a secret key. So that's what I did. I already did that. And if we see, the information's right here. So if we go to workspace and, okay, somehow did I get switched over by mistake? Yes, I did. So you just gotta pay attention when you have multiple windows that you don't get out of one one to another. I don't know if there's a way to force it. I haven't seen looked into that because I use both. Um, but one of the things we want to do is go back to the SQL editor. And we left basic features. So it actually knew where we were. So we can also browse. So I'm going to go to workspace. And I'm going to go into uh, shared under the works uh, warehouse. And we can see this is data lake files and then create from data lake files. So if we click on this, it's probably going to say, hey, guess what? Copy adventure work files data. Let's, if we had time, I'd do Azure Storage Explorer. I'm going to leave that for a little homework for you. The second one is workspace. We're back here. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to warehouse and create from CSV files. And the reason why I'm bringing up this is because I forgot where I put it. And being honest, but it's under the bronze sales LT. So let's go take a look. Remember, we talked about there's many ways to do things in Azure. Another way, if you weren't doing massive transfers, you can just upload a file, right? So storage count, right? We can go to container. We have everything on the ADLS 23, 2020, 2030, I mean. And then underneath there, there was a bronze directory. And then bronze was sales LT, if I remember right. Yes, it is. And then underneath there, we have CSV files. And these are all CSV files. We also have files that were generated by Spark. And here's some different ones. See, we have ORC and PARK A, different addresses. So that's what we're going to work with tonight. If we wanted another file up here, I could say this upload, okay? And I could just browse. This is another way to do it. And I could say, okay, I want to. I was looking at being healthier, a cardiac diet maybe for Mediterranean. I could click on it, right? And if I hit open and then I hit upload, guess what? Now suddenly we got a file in our data lake, okay? Again, we're not going to be doing that for 
you know, say we have an SAP data coming in daily, we're not going to go manually, um, you know, upload files. But if you needed to, there's the way to do it. Okay. So let's go back to our um, second demo. Second demo is, again, I just want to make sure I'm with script. Uh, we talked about setup uh, access. Actually, we're going to wait on the demo. I'm going to get back to this, and then we'll do the demo. I sometimes forget on this presentation exactly where the transition is. So let me, I always have to change to high presentation view. Okay, so loading tables is the next topic, right? We're going to talk about load patterns, okay? You can do a full design uh, load pattern, okay? And that basically just means, hey, replace it in a new version, okay? So that could be something like, say, a state list of states, right? It doesn't change. But guess what? It could also be a list of products, right? And products do change. Or it could be incremental load, right? An incremental load is yeah, so it starts with a launch load, right? It could be a full load followed by a daily update if this data set's not too big. If the data set's really huge, we might want to partition it. We could say, hey, we're going to load monthly for the last 10 years. And then afterwards, we load daily, okay? Um, Delta file format. We talked about this, but I want to go a little more into it, okay? We're not, you don't have to really worry about it once you're in a warehouse, but it's good to know. And, you know, if you're interfacing kind of with the, uh, people who are doing data engineering, it's great to know. Uh, it allows you to have those acid transactions. Basically, it's all file based, but it looks like SQL. Um, scheme enforcement. You can say, hey, I don't want schema to change. Or guess what? You can say merge two schemas. And we'll show you an example of that coming up. Time travel. You can go back and say, hey, what did this look like yesterday before I did the data load? What data did I have? Right? Snapshot isolation. Uh, multiple people can work with the data, so you can have multiple writers, multiple readers, and it's an open source format, okay? Hive tables. <clears throat> we saw this. Anything that you create as a table in the data lake, okay, is going to be matched. Anything that's external is unmatched, okay? So, um, so the interesting thing about manage, drop a table. And guess what? You faced a wheel. Like, I'm <laughs> just joking, but it's Mel Gibson and, uh, you know, Mad Max. But really, drop a table. Guess what? It actually drops it, okay, from the system, okay, all the data. So manage tables, just be careful. Your data is in there because you did insert statements, okay, or copy into's. But guess what? Once you drop it, it's gone. Unmanage. It's just schema, right? So you drop a table. Guess what? It does not result in data loss, okay? Um, and basically advanced copies, and this is example three and four we're going to get into. We're going to talk about how to create the Benchworks database from Parquet files using the copy into syntax into a silver zone we'll talk about. We'll also talk about how to create the Benchworks uh, CSV from as unmanaged, okay? And so this was managed because we're doing copy into. This is unmanaged and external tables in the bronze zone, okay? So those are the two examples we're going to work on right now. So I'm going to start from scratch and then walk through it. So we're going to drop the schema like we did before. Kind of dangerous in demos, but we're going to do it. OK. So if we go here and we look for Eventworks 2, there's Eventworks 1. And it has basically all the data for um, sales LT. But Eventworks 2 doesn't work. It's gone. Dropped it. So we're going to create a database. We're going to alt the schema, add some tags, and then we're going to use the database. Okay. Okay. The syntax. When we use CSV files, again, especially when there's no header fault, see, we need to specify a delimiter. So the delimiter, again, I didn't pick it. This is the data that came from um, the demo database. They, back in the day, did a bulk insert using pipe delimited. But we need to go ahead and tell, hey, drop it if it exists. If not, create it. Give it the columns and the data types using CSV. Give it a fully qualified location. And again, this matches what we put into uh, the data access. And we give it options. And then we select. Okay. So I'm going to run the first one. And then once you know the pattern, I'm just going to run the rest. Okay. I'm going to run. Okay, and now we can see, if we bring this up, here is our currency, 
Okay, so we get the Canadian dollar CAD and so on. So we could go to N probably be USD for US dollars, right? And we can see that uh, we can describe it. So if we describe it, this should match what we have here in string and strength, right? And it does. Okay, awesome. We can also see that uh, owner unknown. We can see the table type. Remember we talked about managed and unmanaged tables. This is an unmanaged table. It's an external table. It's CSV and there's a location. We drop it, it doesn't go away. Okay. So I'm going to just browse all the way through and then I'm going to go for broke. I'm going to say, hey, select everything and run. See what happens. Okay, so this should work. So now I'm going to go here and say run all statements and hit run. Okay, so it's dro actually dropping the database again. So if we go here, we can see Ventureworks 2. And so, oops, and now see, we can see we're building stuff, right? These are just pointers. This is metadata. That's what external tables are to the data that's out there. It's just CSV files. Okay. So that's our first example. That's how you create external tables. Again, I suggest using the Delta format because it supports assets. CSV, not so much. Okay, but I did want to show you that it works on both. And uh, yeah, everything's here. And then you can pick any type you want. Like this very one at the very end was doing internet sales at the very end. But we can select from these, which I didn't. But let's do a quick uh, plus, and I'll show you that they work. Let's create a new query. And we can do select uh, from. Right, and then we do dim currency. And then again, the syntax is a little different. We do top five. Guess what? In Spark, we do limit five. Right? So it's kind of like MySQL. And eventually it's come back. Okay. Let's talk about creating tables from scratch. And we'll show you how to do it. So we're going to open a query. And hopefully it brings it up. So we want query number four. There we go. Okay, again, all our comments are here, kind of, and you know what? We can do this manually too. So, for instance, if I know what I'm doing, sometimes I feel like I do. We used to be able to drop it. One of the things that's interesting is now that I've gone to this new interface, there's no drop here. See, it's interesting. But we can do drop schema cascade, okay? And now if we go here and hit refresh, it's suddenly going away. Oops, see, it says, hey, what's going on there? And it says, like, and tell us, hey, it's still there. It thinks it's there, but it really isn't. So it's not in the catalog anymore. So we can go ahead and say create schema if not exist. And again, put the benchworks one in. Let's look at the syntax. Wow, the syntax is really simple. We're going to create table if not exist, dim currency using delta. Okay, and we're going to give it a location and the sales LT. Okay, and then what we're going to do is this is a blank empty file, delta file, that has no schema. Then I'm going to say copy into this blank empty delta file using this location, the bronze files, parquet format, merge the schema, and then show it, okay? And describe it, and then we're just going to replace it all. So to really show you that this is going to get rid of everything, we're going to delete it from the storage layer, and it's going to recreate it. So we go to Silva. Right, sales LT. We can see these are all delta that currently have data, right? But I'm just going to drop it, get rid of it. So we're going to say sales LT. Okay, go over here. We're going to delete bye bye directory. All my data is gone. Okay, and again, you can do that at the data lake level. Now, if we go ahead and we say run all and hit run, now we should be able to, oops. Syntax, why I did it now? Let me do it. Let's do control A and hit run. I don't know why it was not liking me. But now we can go here, refresh. And now we have Benchworks 1. And we can see it's doing currency trend. And it's going to take a little longer because you know what it's doing is it's first creating an empty file and then it's merging schema, right? And we can also go here and say, oh, yeah, it's what refreshed the lake. Now we get sales LT, and guess what? We're already on product category and now subcategory. And if we hit here, it's a little slower. It's 
still thinks it's geography, but now it finally caught up. See, so now sales reason. Okay, we're going to let that run. And we're going to go back to other topics, okay, or advanced ones, right? So we talked about external tables versus uh, unmanaged versus managed, external versus internal. I'm going to hide the percent of you again. And we're going to go down to the next topic, other topics. Okay, so not only can you do all the stuff we talked about, that copy into can be run multiple times, right? So we can take query and then put it on schedule. If we didn't say create a new table and then merge it in, we just said just copy into. If there was new data there, it would pick up the new data. So please take a look at the syntax of the copy into. It's very powerful. But what we're going to talk about is schedules how to run stuff on predetermined prescribed intervals. We're going to talk about how to create a view to create some data. We're going to talk about how to create visuals, we're going to talk about dashboards, and we're going to talk about alerts, OK? So again, the order is view, visualization, dashboard, and schedule, OK? So we're going to close this. We're going to open the next one. So if I click here and help the existing query, I'll look at for number five. So we can see that number five is open table data. And so we can query it. So for instance, say we want to get some statistics, like, hey, what's going on with this, right? How many rows? Like when I do a data load, usually, I say, how many rows are there, right? Well, this is doing select from this table, get a count, and then union it with the total tags, right? So I can now, if I was comparing before and after, did we get migrate? We can get each table and the total rows here. So we could do a comparison. Very simple way to do that, OK? Another thing is we can create a view. We want to create report prepared data. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this to do some visuals, okay? So this is going to go down here. And we're joining all this data to get the view. And then we're going to select from the view, okay? So it's not aggregated yet. But we're going to use some aggregation to get some really interesting stuff. So now we can see, hey, this is a Cessary. It's a mountain tire, bike tire tube, North America. Um, and then there's, like, who bought it, their age uh and the order number the quantity and so on okay and we can aggregate this now so we can go here and say let's run this and we can see that in 2010 in europe we had two sales okay we didn't have much right that uh was worth four thousand dollars but in 2010 we had six and so on um the sales lt basically adventure works only got really going in 2011 in which we had thousands in 2012, it picked up in 2013, we're doing really well. And 14, this was partial data, okay? So that would be typical. This again, old data, but uh, interesting, right? So now we're gonna open up query number six and take a look. So we created a view, okay? How do we do visualizations? The visualizations, you know what you do is you insert visualization. It's going to have this really interesting curly brackets, pick a year, that gives us a year. So now if we click here and we click the year and we hit apply changes, guess what? It's only going to rerun the query with our pick year, which is a data entry. And now we get the same totals we had before. We can also, again, we don't have that much time tonight to do it. We can do visuals. We can see that these are not the best visuals I've ever seen in my own world life, but they're really kind of impressive, right? It's just here. And so we have the visuals here. And I'm going to do sales by region, and I'm going to do sales by uh, quantity and amount. Right? So we get Europe, North America. We can take those and right click and pin. Okay, I'm not have a time to build it from scratch, but we can go to Adventureworks dashboard, and if we pin it, now we have visuals like this. And so I wanted to say cut and paste and put in a PDF 2012. What we did. We can see 2012, the sales, not exactly the numbers there. Again, you can play around with the visuals, but we can compare it to 2013. And we hit apply, and guess what? Now we get new visuals, OK? So that's how visuals work. Going back to the workspace, OK? And not the workspace, but the query editor, sorry. We want to talk about doing the lurch, right? So how do we do alerts? So what we're going to do is we're going to open up an existing query. To do a watch, right, we have to, where's number seven? 
It's not here. Let me go the other way. And again, I don't teach this topic all the time, so and this is a relatively new one, so just bear with me a little. So warehouse. I must have skipped number seven because maybe I did bad numbering. So basically, we have to schedule a query and then have a work query. Okay. So what we're going to do is this: we're going to we're going to create or replace create table does not exist. Okay. And then we're going to insert in the table some random data, random number for mileage. Okay. And the current timestamp. Okay. And what it's going to do is it has an order increment here. Okay. So if we run this once, okay, it's going, and again, we're going back to, if we look at this, this is going back to uh, ADB. So we're in the wrong database. So we want to go back to here. And we're back to this one, right? And if we hit refresh here, hopefully it'll show us new data. So now we can come here and it's car mileage, right? And we can see this one row. And then if we highlight this, I think it'll work again. That should bring us back to data. And we can see it's one. What we want to do is we want to create alerts. So every five, it notifies us. How are we going to do that? Well, this could be simulation of, hey, I'm getting new data because it creates it only if it doesn't exist. So it's not going to create it. It's going to insert a row, right? Okay? So we need to schedule that. The way you schedule something, you just click on it, you say schedule, and I want this query to run every one minute. There you go. Now we save it, and suddenly it is scheduled. How do we know it's really scheduled? If we go to queries, okay, we can see that right here, it's been scheduled to run every one minute. Okay, great. So we were working on trying to create alert. Well, how do we have alerts? We have a condition we have to give meet. And then once that condition is met, we have to go ahead and alert on it. So that's what we're looking to set up. So we can click on this guy right here, alert query. And this is a very simple query. Case, when the modulus of the mile is five is zero, then guess what? We want to say something happened. And it's a very simple example. So every five, that one minutes, it's going to throw alert, right? So we can save this. We don't want to schedule it. It's right there. Alerts are down here. If we click alerts, okay, what we want to do is we can create from scratch, but I don't have time to do that. But I do have time to enable it. Okay, so we picked that alert query that we just did here, and we're saying, hey, if the first row, which only returns one, is zero, right, trigger condition, then uh, five first rows equal operator zero. Is that right? Let me look at this really quickly. I have made that zero by mistake. So case, when mod is zero, then one, else zero, okay? So the way it's gonna flag all the time. So we could leave it that way if you really want. We're sure to get an alert. And then once in a while, it won't get alert. But um, that's the query we're gonna run. This is who's getting notified, Crafty DBA. This is all my work count too. And we could say, first row, the flag threshold value is zero. We can also say edit, so we need to do an edit. Now, at this point, we need to say refresh, right? We want to refresh this every one minute. We're going to use the default template for alerting, right? We're going to use this warehouse, so it's going to use some compute to do this, okay? And we want to say when this is equal to zero. So we're going to, I'm at one, so save it. So that should give us an alert, okay? Can't guarantee that's going to work. If we look here, hopefully you won't see anything uh, email-wise. We hit refresh. I do not see uh, anything here. Okay, so perfect. So I'm going to get back to the slide deck because um, the other topics are really, really interesting, and they kind of round up the product. I just want to tell you, and then that is pretty much the end of the talk. Uh, while I'm trying to get everything situated, Kevin, any questions? Or it's been pretty quiet tonight. I think we're pretty quiet. There is one question, but it is the type of question that I think is uh, one that we should save for the end. So we'll do that. Awesome. Sounds great. Thank you. So we talked about this. We're going to talk about the unique catalog. So one of the things we talked about the unique catalog is that it has to be enabled for primary and foreign keys. It does work, but it has to be enabled. And there's some restrictions around it. For instance, if you do a unique catalog, then 
uh, what was the thing that we ran against recently at work? I'm trying to think. Oh, yeah. You cannot modify the cluster by adding libraries. It has to be done at a top level behind the scenes management. Okay. So, again, Union Calyx, great. It allows you to share data between stuff, like one cluster and another cluster, and it's a common meta store. But there are some things that, you know, once you turn it on, you have to know about. And you're like, oh, I used to be able to do this. Why can't I? And it's like, well, it's because we need catalogs on. Let's talk about Delta sharing. This is the reason why you really want to turn the unique catalog on. In the past, we had to duplicate data between different silos. So let's, um, you know, Kevin's my friend. He's on here. So Kevin, say, has, you know, a warehouse that he or a data engineering group that has a bunch of hive tables. And Kevin's doing some really interesting machine learning stuff. And he's getting some outputs I really want to look at, right? So now what you can do is we can set up the Unity Catalog and Delta Share to Partner B. Maybe I'm the SQL reporting group and we want to do some reporting and blend the data with his insights, right? So we could do that. We could also even blend with people that are not using database. So in this one, we can see that some people are using Power BI. They use maybe just Spark or Buy Alone, uh, Tableau, and so on. Okay. So Delta Sharing basically allows you to have a catalog that's shared, it's above the Hive catalog that allows you to share access. Table cloning has always been a problem, which how do we sync production with dev, right? Well, there's two ways. There's something called shallow clones and deep clones. Look at the documentation for them. Again, not enough time to go over tonight. But a shallow clone is just basically a reference to the object, right? So we do a snapshot. And then if we make any changes in dev, we're keeping track of those changes. And then guess what? If we reclone it, drop it and reclone it again, we get a new pointer and we stop making changes. Deep clone, we actually, you know, make a copy, okay? Third party products. Some of these products I've used, so you know, I'm just kind of putting them out there for you. Five trend. It's kind of like the market leader. There's also Hebo for moving data. So say you have different data sources like SAP and you say, hey, just run this every five minutes. I want to get any changes and put it into my directory. It'll do that. It also works really well with Snowflake. Okay? Uh, move schemas. The problem is we saw that we have to build this by hand. How do we move it from one place to another? Well, it's tough, right? Can't do it really easily. Guess what? DBT can help you. It basically, it's on uh, Python syntax and then SQL and allows you to move stuff. Uh, last but not least, corporate reporting. Two popular products out there, Tableau and Power BI. In a nutshell, why are we talking about this? Databricks support is for basic SQL queries only, okay? Procedure-oriented queries is not supported. So we didn't see anything that you say, hey, I can do a cursor. We didn't see anything that, hey, create table, I might create store procedure, okay? Or, or create function, okay? Um, it's not supported. I think create function is. Again, I know it's worked uh, supported in um, the data engineering one, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's not supported in the Databricks SQL Warehouse version. I haven't tried it yet. Uh, again, this is not to replace advanced data engineering graph or machine learning workloads that are running in PySpark or engineering that you're already doing. It's just, hey, it's right there. I took this quote from an engineer on Stack Overflow, and I think this pretty much sums up the product. Databricks SQL provides a simple experience for SQL users who want to run quick ad hoc queries on their data lake, create multiple visual types to explore query results from different perspectives, and bill and share dashboards. Okay? Um, I'll get into the summary in one second. I'm going to peek and see if I did get a uh, notification. And guess what? We did get a notification right here. Here's our alert. Guess what? Alert notification OK. And it says, there's our alert. So we did get an alert. Awesome. And I'm going to minimize this back to the last one. And then we can wrap up. And almost on time. So I do apologize for going over a minute too late. I try to get it as close as I can to that one. <laughs> so summary, the migration of data from on-premise to cloud will continue in the future, right? The data lake architecture using Delta tables is really common design, right? It's important to get adoption by existing employees to the new data lake. If they don't, they're not going to use it. Uh, everyone knows SQL, right? So the warehouse allows, you know, the basic technologists with a SQL background get productive, right? Uni Catalog is a great idea if you set it up. It allows different groups to share data lakes and share the data. 
And um, the visualizations and dashboards, I think they're immature at this time. However, I think they will improve over time. And this doesn't have to be the final one stop, right? It could be like you create all your tables and your views, and guess what? You could use Power BI on top of it if you want. In short, consider the warehouse offering for groups of SQL users that need to work with a data lake, but just no SQL, okay? And there's a bunch of references here. So Databricks documentation, uh, SQL function is good, SQL language. Uh, we talked about creating the service principle. We didn't need that. Storage Explorer and Secret Scopes. And that's about it. So we're at the questions time. I'm going to go ahead and find hopefully the right window. Sorry about that. I'm going to turn my camera on and I'm going to stop sharing. All right. So um, the main question we've got in chat, and by the way, if anybody in chat has questions, now is the perfect opportunity to get them in. Uh, but the main question is, I'm new to Databricks and Big Data. Could you share any sites or resources to learn and do some hands-on SQL uh, with Databricks? Awesome. Great question. Uh, let me share my desktop again, and then I will show you. While John's doing that, let me drop again a link to the GitHub repo from today's talk, which is another good resource for this. Databricks and learning. Databricks has this whole thing called Learning Academy, okay? And so what you can do is you can get certified. I actually been wanting to get certified. I just, they automatically just um, hide this. They just tap me on too many projects as a consultant. So I never get there. I'm like, I started studying, I had some downtime, and just never got to the final point. But um, I'm the company I work for, we're a partner. But what you can do is you can actually go and join into this, okay? And there's some free learning tracks. So you can say, hey, I took the Databricks fundamentals. I did that. I took the, you know, engineering on pipe, uh, you know, Delta Lake using Python. I took that too. And then they have two several certification levels. Um, there's videos here. Some of them are free, some of them not. But definitely sign up. This is one resource. Also, this is through Microsoft too, so try it. So, because if you're using it again, one of the things you want to use, why you want to use Databricks or Snowflake is the cross-platform. It's not just like one product on one place, right? You're not stuck in Azure. If you don't want to be in Azure, go somewhere else, right? So, Databricks works on AWS and Google, and that's the same thing with Snowflake. If you go to Microsoft and look at Databricks, they have their own documentation too. So, there's two sets of documentation you can go to. Uh, Azure.com, Databricks, and you can get a free account through Microsoft. You can also, they have a popular uh, community version for Databricks. That's another way to do it. But uh, I always have problems finding documentation. I don't I like the website anymore, but Microsoft. Okay, here we go. So there's a ton of Databricks information here. There's also the Databricks. Databricks. This is where I usually go. Uh, docs. And there's their documentation. And just one second. I'm going to grab a book that's right off the shelf. Hang on a second. All right. So while John is doing that, I put in a couple of links. One is for getting started with uh, Databricks Academy, which is, in the case of the link that I gave, was through Microsoft. Uh, one was for community.databricks.com, and then community.cloud.databricks.com, which is the free edition that John uh, referred to. Yep. So Matthias Zaharia is one of the founders. This was built. Okay, Spark was built at, was it UCA Berkeley? Am I guessing right? Yep, it was UC Berkeley, part of the AMP Lab. Yep, and Bill Chambers and Matira Zahara. This is an older book. It's version three. Uh, well, it's a ver it's like came out about six years ago. It's called Spark: The Definitive Guide. But if you buy this, is more than you'll ever want to know. <laughs> I haven't finished reading. Have you, Kevin? I have not finished that one. Actually, there's one other book that I would recommend, and not just because the guy lives in my town. But uh, Jean-Georges Perrin has put out a book, Spark in Action, which is by oh, Manning. Cool. And that one covers uh, Java, Scala, and Python. But he's, 
that's a pretty good book as well. Oh, that's it. So, oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and again, I'm not just plugging him. I just happened to read this guy. He's like a definitive guy. And that was like, you know, it's a really good, uh, you know, guide for doing, you know, asking questions. But, you know, once you get into this, you're going to be like, hey, by the way, you know, I already know something. I just need some reference. Um, there's like Spock by examples. You probably do that all the time, right? And skull examples. And you always have to look at Python syntax because, yeah, I think I'm relatively smart, but <laughs> I don't remember everything at this time of my life. How about you, Kevin? Can you, do you have a photographic memory? Um, no, no, no. Exactly. <laughs> I cheat. I, I copy other people's work and make it my own. I do. But at least I understand it and, you know, I document it well. So that way it lives on. So, um, yeah, thank you for having me, Kevin. I, hopefully any more questions? If not, I, you know, hopefully you get something out of this topic. Uh, looks like no more questions. So what we're going to do, actually, I want to drop in one more link in here. And this is a book that a couple of guys have been writing. Landon Robinson has been writing this book um, online for the past several years uh, at a website called Hadoopsters. And this is their Spark Starter Guide, uh, still actively being developed. He releases wow. chapter sections uh, every once in a while, and um, it's it's a pretty good introductory guide to the topic. So um, that's also a good site to check out. And uh, thanks from Raymond Samuel, and also thanks from everybody else in chat for a great session, John. Um, Thank you. What we're going to do now is wrap things up for this evening. So again, everybody, uh, thank you for coming in. We are done with meetings for the month. Our next meeting will be the second Tuesday of April, and we'll have one in-person meeting this month. The other two will be virtual, and then starting in May, we'll have two virtual, one hybrid. So stay tuned for all those details, and until we see each other again, everyone... Take care. Have a great spring. Take care.